Hello folks and welcome back. I hope everyone is doing very well and studying very hard as always. I've got a little presentation that I've put together. Okay, that has about 46 slides that we're going to go through. That's although it's going to be very, very fruitful for those in this journey in regards to seeking the truth and where we're going to be looking at the forensics of the forms involving my beginning and our beginning. Okay, so it's all the same in relation to our born and birth events. Okay, that's although it's going to expose the whole system for what it is complete fraud, clandestine operation in order to enslave the masses, where I found out from analysing these forms that I've effectively been born and declared as a stillborn baby who's died without a will and test date, right, imbued with a criminal charge by virtue of my parents becoming informants. Okay, so we're going to dig a little bit deeper, put on our investigative hats, which will otherwise show that the emperor has got no clothes, shine more light in this darkness, okay, and otherwise come back to life, take back control, level up, and um, be the ones that we've been waiting for in regards to you know, putting pen to paper and really helping to shift this system because the time to do it is now in regards to you know, the age of revelation that we're in. And um, hopefully presentations like this will help those folks on this journey in order to you know, put the pieces of the puzzle back together. Okay, so it's very important that we come out from amongst them my people will come out from amongst her, my peoples, it mentions in the book of Revelation, so you not be partaker of her sins, her debts, okay, because that's what we've been pledged as collateral for, is all of this debt, all right, debt is sin, sin is linked to the sine wave, which is linked to time, which is linked to calendar, calendar means the, the reckoning of debts and taxes, okay, so you need to stop being pledged to the clock, which is old man Kronos, which is Saturn, which is Satan, which is after undeniably researching in what I'm about to expose for these governments and the, the legal procedures and formalities is certainly the prince of this world still. Okay, so it's up to us to take back our crown and dethrone the prince and otherwise come back into our kingship and queenship, just like Jesus did. All right, so I'm going to weave a little bit of the Bible in with this as well, which is very important with scripture, so that's their code book. And otherwise look at a little bit of history surrounding the law of Mortmain, the lodial title and the paper ball Unum Sanctums and otherwise what the Vatican's been getting up to, um, you know, for at least the last thousand years, which is quite interesting. It all ties in, all connects. So enjoy, get comfortable, and we'll work our way through this. So in the Bible, in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, so we've got to ask ourselves the question, who is God? Okay, you've got a little hint down there with the sword next to the Bible, and God's Word has authority. All right, otherwise a famous painting with God personified in human form within the brain, reaching out to touch Adam, the fleshy man or woman, to remind them that God isn't without you, it's within. Okay, and that's where we've, we've got to look in order to you know, make that connection to our higher self and come into greater truths and revelations during this period and be guided by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, not the Holy Ghost. It's obviously the words, okay? So all of us in this journey, I know, you know, we know that the word governs our body politics, and this is otherwise what is codified in their acts. That is basically the script to act out the play for the actors, okay? And it's all a theatre. That's why you have the theatre of commerce, and you even have the theatre of operations within war and battles, okay? And also theatres within the hospital, okay? So all of this system relies on is personas, and dead fictional characters and for the real living man or woman to step in to wear that mask and act out whatever it is that that role is imbued with in regards to the terms and conditions okay because that is what governs the body politics of whole organizations and the people within them okay the principals and the agents the council officers all right and so we have at an international level Black's Law Dictionary, Blackstones, and Bouviers are really good to get your hands on in order to help you crack the code and decode in this system. And you also have at a domestic level, some countries issue their own legal dictionaries. Okay, here in Australia, for example, it's the LexisNexis, Concise Australian Legal Dictionary, and also the legislation and statutory interpretation. And you can also go on to their legislation, no matter where you are, and each act would otherwise have an interpretation and or definitions okay, which will help decode what it is they're actually saying, okay, because as we know, we can't take anything at face value with these guys, given their legalese 
and the different definitions to what we otherwise will think are quite trivial on the surface in plain simple English. Okay, and this also applies to every facet of life, none more so than media, which is the Greek goddess of illusion, okay, and all the things that they're casting out, all the spells on a broad level, broadcasting, um, in order to entrain the masses. Okay, and they've got deep fake technology, AI now, they've got masks. All right, so we cannot take anything at face value. We must don our investigative hats, ask questions, seek the answers ourselves. And don't even believe a thing I say, okay, and look at the evidence and uh, burn the proof is always on the claimant and do your digging. And that's why I have, that's why, you know, I put this YouTube channel together in this course, because in order to dispel the darkness, you must first have the context, okay, and perspective and zoom out and think outside of the box and see the box of what it is. Once you know what's going on at that level, you can start looking at the finer details and certainly find the devils hiding in the details. And it's much better the devil we know than the devil we do not know, okay? And I remember a famous quote by Gwen Wyckoff, the author of, co-author of the Past in the Buck volumes. She said, until you know evil, you know nothing, okay? And so this is the whole basis, I believe, of our time here is to learn the knowledge of good and evil, okay? So we must learn it by, yeah, end of this presentation, you'll certainly find out um, one degree of evil, or one level of what it is they're doing, okay? so. The word is very important, guys, so I highly recommend going out, getting these dictionaries, buy tabs, get a highlighter, because you can learn a lot otherwise from case law that they reference and historical um, interesting tidbits, too, in relation to these definitions, okay, which you can go and get on Amazon, which will help every single one of us on this journey. It's helped me, and it's so important that you take back control, and like I said, level up and um, become the change you wish to see and research all this stuff yourself. So they can't trick you anymore. So it also says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, in the beginning the earth was without form. And it's interesting that, you know, a form contracted us into their world. Okay, maybe a form could get us out. But we have the Holy Bible as their code book. As we know, it is the rule book for the age of Pisces that we have been in for the last 2,000 years. Just research procession of the equinoxes. If those of you listening aren't familiar. Moses and the Old Testament governed the age of Aries, okay, which dealt with sacrifice. Then we had Jesus probated the age of Aries and brought in the New Testament, okay, when the sun moved into Pisces at the Vernal Equinox 2,000 years ago. The last one in Testament, that's called, okay. We are now entering the age of Aquarius, which will usher in the 1,000 years of peace in Christ's millennial kingdom, okay. So the New Testament is this age of Pisces. The Old Testament is the age of Moses and Aries. We are now at the brink where the New Testament in regards to the age of Pisces with the Holy Bible will be probated, Okay, to usher in the age of Aquarius. And interestingly, listening to Bill Turner's presentation, there were 777 books, which is quite an interesting synchronicity, given that a lot of people of God and following the truth in this journey are coded with 777. Um, and I certainly had that shift as well back in the 7th of July, 2023, which is a 777 portal. As we know, the number of the devil, Mark of the Beast, is 666. Okay, so this, this is definitely codified and this is happening energetically. There is going to be a separating of the wheat from the chaff and the splitting of these timelines, which is also mentioned in some other esoteric science teachers, such as Ashiana, in regards to a crystal river failsafe host, bridge zone, okay, that's otherwise linked to uh, what they mentioned, a thousand years apiece. So, testaments, wills, probating, okay, everything is done by a declaration and by our will, all right? If we look at the definition of testament, Latin, a will, historically, a will dealing only with personal property, but nowadays includes wills generally. Okay, see also last one in testament, testamentary instrument and will. And we have will out of Lexis Nexis is, sorry, the black store is a wish, desire, choice, for example, employment at will, also terms human will, and the legal expression of an individual's wishes about the disposition of his or her property after death, especially a document by which a person directs his or her estate to be distributed upon death. For instance, there was no mention of his strange brother in the will. Also termed testament, will and testament, archaically testamentary instruments. And to just give more credence, you know, to these, these grand cycles of time that happen with the precession of the equinoxes and these, these shifting rulers that are imbued in astrology with the planets and the, the given signs, right? I did a presentation four years ago now. Um, called Corona Period, Crown of Moment, Age of Aquarius, Second Coming of Christ, Sovereignty, that I highly recommend to those who haven't watched it, go back and watch, because it otherwise will just provide that perfect perspective, and paint a bigger picture as to the drama 
that is unfolding um, that we're very much a part of on Earth at this time, um, given that the great sign in heaven actually happened in September 23rd, 2017. Okay, and interestingly, that's when my crown chakra awakening experience happens. Okay, so as above, so below, we're very much intricately connected to these, these wanderers and stars above, okay, which is God's word. So we have in Matthew 24, 30, then will appear the sign of the Son of the Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Okay, the only man in the zodiac that the sun travels through in the ecliptic is Aquarius, pouring forth the, the spiritual waters of awakening that we're all currently, you know, bearing witness to and, and embodying in this, this revelationary period. All is being revealed. That's the apocalypse is revealing all that has been hidden in darkness. That's why these guys are panicking. And to kind of give more, again, credibility to this changeover with the the Pope before Pope Francis resigns. Pope Francis is meant to be the last Pope around 2012, 2013 that's happened. There was a thunderbolt that struck the St. Peter's Basilica or whatever it's called, Cathedral, um, shortly after I think they announced the, the resignation or the new assigned Pope. And um, that all goes back to Jupiter, Jupiter Zeus, J. Zeus, Jesus, right? Just we, I am who is the ruler in the age of Pisces, and Uranus is the ruler for the first thousand years of Aquarius, which in Greek means heaven. And also, again, going into the importance of words, this man's research is unprecedented. He doesn't get enough credit or coverage. Um, I've read his books, watched his presentations, absolutely amazing research. Otherwise, again, going into the research, into the etymology, the paranomasia, across all ancient languages, including Aramaic and um, Hebrew and the likes, to otherwise show insurmountable proof that our governments were founded by the so-called shaitani, which are basically off-world, angelic, spiritual, corporeal and incorporeal beings, okay, of an extraterrestrial, interdimensional nature. And these are otherwise hosts and ships of states that correspond to ships in other dimensions that are used to govern the mind, okay, hence ment is the root word of mental, and govern is to govern the minds of the masses. It's all population control. So coming back down to earth, in the beginning, there were contractions, weren't there? Your mother would have been having contractions before you're about to be expelled from the womb, which has kind of given us a hint as the word contract is in there. We had a ward, okay, and we had a delivery room. We had the warders broke, and we came down a birth canal where a doc was ready to receive us, or sorry, a doctor was ready to receive us. And we had a birth and a born event, okay? And we also had a crown, because when we come through in a conventional birth, the top of our head's the first to show to come out, which is our crown, our crown chakra. And that's certainly been stolen from us given these procedures, as we'll find out. And we had a form. Okay, so let's have a look at a few of these definitions. Delivery, for instance, and this is taken out of LexisNexis, Australian Legal Dictionary, is the transfer of actual constructive possession from one person to another. Hmm, interesting. Then we have ward out of Black's Law, a person, usually a minor, who is under a guardian's charge or protection. And we have ward in the LexisNexis is a subdivision of a local government area. Hmm, interesting. So here's the certificate of birth form, okay, that my parents and everyone who's born into this world is kind of coerced into filling out so that new product, that new vessel, that baby can be pledged or become part of the citizenship, right? So if we do the forensics on this form, which is what my father filled out for my birth, you can see at the top there, child, what was given the the first name in full, Alexander George, and my birth date. And notice how the, the father's name, okay, which is the surname, is separated from the given name. It's in a completely different box. But even in my father's name, his given name, first name, is separated with the surname too, which will become very important very shortly, as well as my mother. But if we look down the bottom here, we can see that there's two interesting words that we must look at the definitions of is information and informant. And it says here that my father would have certified that the information shown on this form is correct for the purpose of being inserted in the register of births. And then you've got the signature of informant. Okay, so let's check out what an informant is. In criminal law, 
and this is taken out of LexisNexis, is a person who lays in information in respect of a criminal charge and commences a criminal prosecution as a result. See also common informant, information informer, police informant, prosecutor. Hmm, that's interesting. Then we have also information. One, an allegation that a person has committed a criminal offence which is laid before a court or justice and is the first step by which a prosecution is commenced. For example, Magistrates Court Act 1930, Criminal Procedure Act 1921, Summary Offence. The basic character of an information is to inform a justice that an offence is alleged to have been committed and in what circumstances. That's in Wright versus Mooney. The initial writ by which certain civil and criminal proceedings are initiated containing a precis of the facts. See also arrest warrant, complaint, informant, pleadings, summons, and writ. Hmm, it's a bit suspicious, isn't it? Now we've got another word up here, child. Okay, in Births, Deaths and Marriages Registration Act 2003, Schedule 2, Dictionary. Birth means the expulsion or extraction of a child from its mother. Child includes a stillborn child. Inclusio unius est exclusio alterius. This Latin maxim translates to inclusion of one is the exclusion of another. It is a principle of a statutory interpretation that suggests that when a statute expressly includes certain things, it implies the exclusion of others not mentioned. In other words, if a statute lists specific items, it is presumed that items not listed are intentionally excluded from the statute's scope or application. Hmm, that's a bit odd. And then child in Black's Law is also an unemancipated person under the age of majority. That is very interesting, isn't it? So I've never, they've never issued me another certificate to say that I'm a man or I'm an adult. So I'm still considered a child, which is a stillborn and an emancipated person under the age of majority. So by virtue of my father filling out the certificate of birth form and sending it to the registrar, the registrar entered into his book a stillborn child with a criminal charge who died without a will and test date. This registration joined the given name with the name of the father and produced the ends legis government created fiction, which is a juristic person commonly referred to as a straw man, evidenced by the issuance of the birth certificate. Okay, so now you can see this is the ex extract from birth entry. So this is otherwise what was put into the book, the registrar's book. And you can see here that the given name, this is when they start to bring in the father's name, okay, next to the given name and making joinder to me, the given name, right? And you can see this separated by a double space, which is indicative of the two separate entities, okay? And otherwise down there in the entry number, that's indicative of the year of my birth, which is 1989, and the number of what I was in regards to that year born, that I was the 5,249th baby to be born within the Corporation of Australia in the year of 1989, okay? so. When we go to identify ourselves as the live born entity or have our live born identity, you want to just be using your given name with that entry number. Okay, and you can either use it, which is how it's displayed on the extract, like that 89052.49, or you can use it how it's displayed on the registration number on the birth certificate. Okay, so they're both corresponding to the same, but the numbers are just slightly different. So if we have a look at the definitions here of artificial person, right, we have an entity such as a corporation created by law and given certain legal rights and duties of a human being. A being, real or imaginary, who for the purpose of legal reasoning is treated more or less as a human being. An entity is a person for purposes of the due process and equal protection clauses, but is not a citizen for purposes of the privileges and immunities clauses in Article 4, Subsection 2 and in the 14th Amendment, also termed conventional person, fictitious person, juristic person, juridical person, legal person and moral person. We've got artificial person out of LexisNexis. It's an entity recognized by law, but which is not a real person. For example, a company. See, for example, the seminal case of Solomon versus Solomon and Co. Limited, and see also company. Okay, so it should be quite obvious what's going on here. So we also have, this is the birth certificate. So as a result of them entering that information from the source document, which is the certificate of birth that my father filled out, the registrar entered into his book which you saw in the extract where the given name was starting to be joined to the name of the father, thus off the back of that was produced a birth certificate, okay? So once again, you can see child where the given name has been joined to the name of the father, the parents or the pair who rents are down as informant, effectively charging the estate and this entity criminally, and the birth certificate is printed on security paper, proving that we have now become security for the national debt. It can also be interpreted as your death certificate, 
as it indicates the deceased estate, but is also a warehouse receipt, a bill of lading, a dock warrant, okay, to the Baileys in possession, who are the government via the public trust, public trustee, treasury, and all other crown instrumentalities administering your estate and the crown, okay? The crown is effectively the Vatican. It's like a corporation soul that can act through any and all instrumentalities instrumentalities that are beneath it. This is why when you go to birth, deaths, and marriages, you can get your hands on any number of these birth certificates, okay? And what's interesting, that it is printed on securities paper, which is very posh paper, okay? So we'll find out what securitization means. So the substitution of loans by marketable financial instruments. An example is when a bank assets such as loans and mortgages are sold to a company which raises funds by issuing negotiable securities. The beneficial ownership of the assets is shared among a large number of small investors. Securitization began in Australia with bills of exchange and promissory notes where something otherwise unmarketable like a loan becomes a marketable asset. It circumvents the problem of a debt such as a mortgage simply remaining on the lender's books until eventually it's repaid. Okay, and that's taken out the Lexus Nexus. Then we have out the Black's Law. Securitize is to convert assets into negotiable securities for resale in the financial market, allowing the issuing financial institution to remove assets from its books and thereby improve its capital ratio and liquidity and to make new loans with the security proceeds if it so chooses. Okay, securitized, securitization. So isn't that very interesting? Because of the system that we're in, where securities have replaced substance as collateral for debt, it means that we've all been made marketable through the name of our straw man, which is the Holy Ghost. Okay, and because ever since 1933, where they created this, this straw man, where they debased the currency, where they took the US dollar off the gold standard, that otherwise every other currency was pegged to around the world, they had to create a colorable law system, a debased law system to govern the kind of contracts that were now being formed through these transactions of doing business with this new debt-based fiat currency note, this non-redeemable non -redeemable negotiable instruments. Okay, so this is where they came up with the Uniform Commercial Code, okay, which otherwise is hidden and codified within statutory jurisdiction. And this is what's being administered in the courts. But they don't want to label it as such. It's a color of amorty maritime law, but it's effectively statutory jurisdiction because they needed to come up with something that was governing the contracts now using monopoly money. Okay, because it wasn't backed by anything of substance, it's merely securities, okay, ink on paper. And if you look at the definition of paper in Black's Law, it means evidence of a debt. Okay, so we're living in a system where there is actually no money by the true proper definition of the term money, okay? It's all debt, a promise to pay at some point in the future, a bill of exchange from the creditor, a promise to really note from a debtor or consumer, promising to pay at some point in the future until such time we come back to substance or there's a jubilee, right? Or someone le learns and knows how to set off and balance the books, okay? So as a result, we've been made and pledged the surety and collateral for all the debt. That's why everything that is born into that given corporation is owned, the legal title which is owned by the international creditors, who are the ones who have indebted the governments that have pretty much taken them over due to the bankruptcy and insolvency that they're in and the administration that they're running, okay, which is another very key term that we must look into, which is administration, okay, but there's a few other key terms we're going to get into which will help us ex explain and understand exactly what is going on. One of which is persona. Okay, so we know we've got this fictional straw man entity set up, which is a mere image of ourself. Okay, it's mere ink on paper. It's a shadow, it's like a shadow self. It's a twin, a shadow twin. Okay, it's a person, an individual human being. By the Roman law, every human being who had rights, other than such were merely personal or were subject to obligations or duties, had two personalities or personas. One natural, the other legal, artificial and fictitious. And it was in the latter that his rights were vested and upon the latter that his obligations and duties were imposed. It was a peculiarity of the legal personality that being the creature of law, it continued to exist so long as there was any reason for its existence. It was not affected, therefore, by the death of the natural person, but continued its existence in the natural person's successor or heir. And that's pretty much what we're dealing with, guys, um, and have been for a very long time. And I've seen names for some of these bank accounts which are linked to trusts on a committee of 300 documents that's probably 
you know, been around ever since ancient times because these names are King David, Moses from the Bible, King Solomon, all right, the Alpha and Omega, and all these, these famous characters and artifacts throughout time that we hear about in history and myth are just bank accounts, they're trusts. In other ways, these fictional entities that can exist in perpetuity. And this is what these guys are using to manage the whole plantation, right? And so, like I said before, all of these mere ink on paper personas need actors. They need agents to step up and give it life, to charge it life. They need the real living being to step in, to take on that role and say, yep, okay, I'm willing to play this role. Okay, you're willing to play this role? Fair enough, here are the rules. These are all the statutes and acts. You're now surety for all the debt. You're liable if you do not follow these, these Amity martial law um, codes of conduct and trust indenture that we've written out, then, you know, as trustee, you're going to be penalized, fined, feed, levied, and, you know, we've got a hell of a lot of debt now that you've got to pay. So, you know, it's much better to come out from amongst them, learn how to play the game. In other words, separate yourself as authorized representatives, secure party and creditor, principal beneficiary, et cetera, et cetera. So again, you know, on the back of the birth certificate, you can see it reads, security features include five distinct watermarks depicting a cascade and eucalyptus leaf, best viewed by holding the document up to the light, embedded security fibers that illuminate under UV light. The word copy is revealed in the background print with the document is photocopied, et cetera. So you gotta, you ask yourself the question, like why would they go to so much hassle in order to print a birth certificate on such posh paper? Okay, that costs a lot of money and you can print any number of these okay which if you know how to fill out the back of with you know the proper stamps and under the bill of exchange act you can you can turn that into credits okay and that's exactly what these guys do so the public trust takes insurance out on your life as part of the SETI KV trust and files an election with the high court in order to retain letters of administration to administer your estate all proceeds from your estate are invested and accrue in trust for periods of two six and 25 years when they move from the unclaimed monies fund to the consolidated fund, treasury investment suspense account and the funds and special funds that effectively forms the Commonwealth. We have, so the governments have run an administration as a result of what they're doing, okay, and what they're managing, which is all these deceased estates, these dead fictional entities. So we have administration is the performance of the executive function of the government as opposed to the judicial and legislative functions. It is the management of the affairs of a bankruptcy Okay, and it's also the management of a deceased estate by a person duly authorized to act as executor or administrator, depending on whether the appointment was made by will or by the high court. Okay, and it's important as well to look at the difference between insolvency and bankruptcy, even though, as you'll find out, both terms would apply for the state of governments and most corporations today, given the nature of the system. So insolvency is a state of economic distress Whereas bankruptcy is a court order that decides how an insolvent debtor will deal with unpaid obligations. Okay, that usually involves a selling assets to pay the creditors and erasing debts that can't be paid. So you have administration in Bouvier's online is when a business can no longer meet its debt obligations. Interesting. Can we pay our debts with the money that we have at the moment? No, we can't. It's a mere promise to pay at some point in the future when such time we come back to these negotiable instruments backed by something of substance, or there's a jubilee. So no, none of these governments, nor us, nor any of these corporations within this structure can actually fulfill their debt obligations, okay? Administrative law is the body of law that regulates government decision-making. You have administration and trusts, the management of the estate of an intestate, a minor, a lunatic, an habitual drunkard, or other person who is incapable of managing his own affairs entrusted to an administrator or other trustee by authority of law. In a more confined sense than which it will be used in this article, administration is the management of an intestate estate or of the estate of a testator who, at the time administration was granted, had no executor. Okay, and so we've got administration down here from LexisNexis. Succession is the management of deceased estate by a person authorized to act as executor or administrator, depending on whether the appointment was made by will or by the courts. Administration involves collecting the deceased's assets, paying debts, and distributing the balance of the estate to the persons beneficially entitled to it. In order to bring in the general administration of a deceased estate or trust under the court's control, where there is a question between the trustees and beneficiaries. See also administrator, executive, executor, letters of administration, voluntary administration. As we know, as I've proven, 
If all died as a stillborn, without a will and testate, in view of a criminal charge, which meant that all property in our estate is skeeted, devolved, made bona vacantia, okay, to the crown, which acts through the governments and the state. The public trustee makes an election to become the administrator. And because our parents aren't educated and they're part of the, the mind control and the entrainment, epigenetically for so many generations, um, they are none the wiser and they just go along to get along and follow all these procedures without asking any questions or using their minds because they're not taught how to think, they're taught what to think. Again, another one, administrator, a person who directs or manages the affairs of another. Succession, a person appointed by the court under letters of administration to manage or administer a deceased estate which has no executor. An appointment of an administrator will be made if the deceased dies in test date. For example, Probate and Administration Act 1898. Or if, having left a valid will, no executor was appointed by the will or the executor nominated as unable or unwilling to act. Letters of administration are usually granted to persons interested in the estate of the deceased. If no one else is willing to take it out, may be granted to a creditor. Where the estate is believed to be insolvent, then in certain circumstances, a public trustee may be appointed as administrator. Unlike the office of an executor, the office of an administrator is not transferable by representation. Where an administrator dies, a fresh grant must be made. See also administration, executor, letters of administration, personal representative, and intestacy. Okay, so once... An administrator is appointed. It can only be done so by the court through a grant, letters of administration. However, the office of executor can be enacted through representation. Okay, and that's where the father name, the father's name comes in, the last name entity, which is linked to our SETI-KB trust. You can make executor that they can act through in right of. So the crown can act in right of your surname in order to have things dis disposed of by your will. So have a look here in the Acts in Queensland, in Australia, Public Trustee Act 1978, Section 31, appointment of public trustee in the place of existing personal representative. Now, if we go down to subsection 1ABV, states that where the deceased is intestate, which is us, or where the deceased left the will and no person has applied for probate or letters of administration with the will annexed within a period of three months from the death of the deceased, the public trustee may apply for and be granted in order to administer the estate left unadministered. Subsection four states that on an application under subsection one or two A, the public trustee shall be entitled as of right to an order to administer. Okay, so you can see there that it is after three months of our birth certificate being issued, so our registration taken in effect in the books, that the public trustee steps in and claims our estate uh, because we're considered a decadent who's died without will intestate, like I said before, stillborn, and our parents are none the wiser. Most people think it's seven years under the SETI KB Act 1666. It's not, it's as early as three months, and that's when they start administering and managing um, your investment accounts on your behalf. So we have an organization that calls itself the government that is administering deceased estates because we have all died without a will intestate by virtue of the language, definitions on the forms and procedures in law surrounding our birth. The living son and daughter identified by a given name has been made surety and security for all of the national debt by accommodation to the ends league of straw man. The straw man is an agent in commerce created for our benefit in order to interact in their corporate world or rather drag us into their underworld. However, this entity is a vacant position and it does need an agent to represent it. Through subrogation and us answering to that name, we play the role of trustee in their commercial theater. Under their acts, where we must act out the trustee's role or face penalties for not following the letter of the trust indenture, which is their legislation, statutes, and acts. Trustee always has to pay. And the Crown becomes the executor, beneficiary, and administrators. As the rightful living heir and beneficiary, which is us, has been declared a stillborn and or dead lost at sea who died without will and testate, where no distributions can be made, as a beneficiary is assumed to presume dead, thus all property is made bona vacancy and devolves the skeets to the crown, and the crown can be seen as the head of this corporate trust structure, which acts in right of any and all instrumentalities beneath it. Thus, it's like the Joker in a deck of cards. And if you've got that famous American Pie song, there's a famous verse in there which goes like this. So, and while the king was looking down, the justice towards thorny crown, the courtroom was adjourned, no verdict was returned. And the Joker, it's kind of like the crown is like the Joker, the jester, right, in the deck of cards that can come in 
and beat any card within the deck. That's kind of this, this crown entity, which is basically the Vatican, coming and acting right of the Commonwealth, acting right of England, Canada, Australia, the Treasury, okay, and any other corporation too, and even under the legal profession acts, right, which is pretty much the private legal firms are completely controlled that the crown can act through as well and right of, and they're all linked. Okay, even though they kind of give the illusion of this separation, it's all different snakes and the head of Medusa. Um, so yeah, they got the jester down there because you know when we weren't looking or our parents weren't paying attention, our, our crowns were robbed from us. Okay, so it's much better to during this corona period, which also means crown, is to you know take our crown back, not the crown of thorns, but otherwise the, the pearly or the golden, the golden crown, right, of eternal life and wisdom and truth. So this setup effectively creates this duplicitous arrangement of debtors, creditors within a system that is already insolvent and in bankruptcy, as there is no money in which to pay, only debt notes. And those notes are promises to pay at some time in the future, which continue to accrue interest to the creditors. This is why every country and corporation is in a state of emergency with, with their citizenry charged as the enemy, because they're at war with us by virtue of being criminals who continue to support the system when using the private company's fiat debt notes that only increases the debt burden of the nation. This is why people get treated so badly because literally through, by virtue of this system and how they got it set up, that straw man entity is a criminal. You are, when you're acting on behalf of that and thinking that you are that name and acting as surety for it and representing it without having that separation, right? You, you are a criminal and you are causing the corporation burden because whenever you're using their private central bank fiat debt currency notes, it's accruing interest and that interest has to be served, okay? Because they only ever provide the principal amount of the money supply and not the interest, all right? So it's, it's a system designed, it's flawed from the, you know, from the start, but it's designed to keep everyone in perpetual debt servitude, okay? So it's much better to come out from amongst them, like I said, learn the game that's being played and stop playing the role of the Holy Ghost, okay, the straw man. Thus, all of the property, us and the GDP, which is why they hold legal title of the corporation has been pledged as collateral to secure the debt in order to maintain the administration under bankruptcy and insolvency. Similar to a hybrid between chapter 11 and 7 bankruptcy, in bankruptcy and insolvency, everything is insured, bonded and licensed. This is why everything has to be underwritten, given ratings and permission to do things under license. Okay, And the insurance companies run the world. Okay? That's why they have to underwrite everything the banks do. In other words, give them credit ratings too. So it's actually the insurance firms, okay, that are the most powerful group of fellows. But what you find is all these families and these these entities, they, they own all of them anyway. Okay, it's just kind of giving the illusion again of this separation. When in reality, the shareholders, the masterminds, the directors, uh, they're all the same. So a few definitions here. We got insolvent. All right, this is taken out of Black's Law of a debtor having liabilities that exceed the value of assets. We know that within every corporate government or corporation masquerading government, having stopped paying debts in the ordinary course of business or being unable to pay them as they fall due, tick, tick, tick. Yes, we can't pay our debts because we haven't got money back for anything the substance, it's promises to pay, and liabil liabilities definitely exceed assets, um, just given the nature of any national debt clock that you can find and hop online to have a look at. Insolvency, Black's Law again, the condition of being unable to pay debts as they fall due, or in the usual course of business, the inability to pay debts as they mature. Bankruptcy, the quality, state, or condition of being without enough money to pay back what one owes, okay? Also termed failure to meet obligations and failing circumstances. A statutory procedure by which usually an, an insolvent debtor obtains financial relief and undergoes a judicial supervised reorganization of the debtor's assets for the benefit of the creditors, okay? So what these families did was effectively in debt the governments that were for the people, with the people, right? They're otherwise paying out distributions and dividends to the beneficiaries who were the citizens um, from the Commonwealth, which are basically, you know, any, any resources that were sold and exported to other countries to go towards providing for housing and energy, right? So society can otherwise focus more of their time and energy in their higher potential, okay? In public works and volunteering, and it just makes everything so much better rather than this this scarcity economic model of fear which only drives more separation between rich and poor okay so through kind of these getting them in debt and then manipulating the interest rates in order for them to default they can then come in demand their pound of flesh and otherwise 
you know, capture, capture them under bankruptcy, the C, right, bankruptcy, and insolvent C within the maritime amorty Cs, um, with their currencies <laughs> and interest rates, where they can't meet their obligations and obviously under failing circumstances can say, right, okay, well, if you can't pay us back, this is what we want you to do. You're gonna have to reform the whole thing. We want you to run this administration. We want you to pass this act, this bill, set up the income taxes. Um, we're gonna you know, start pledging your citizens for collateral because you know we need something to make sure that you're gonna pay us back. So this is how it's done clandestinely through, through the moon eye, right? So I put the monopoly there, which is the one that controls the many. You've got to look at, pay attention to that word, the M-O-N or the M-O-O-N and these spheres of influence that have a direct effect of us down here that kind of gives a clue away as to what the moon is, okay, because it's the moonarchy and the monetary system and the moonopoly and specifically the moon eye, which is the biggest religion on the planet that's being used to manipulate the consciousness of everyone, okay, and the moon eye is the one-eyed king and in the world of the blind, the one-eyed king, the one-eyed man is king. Okay, so you've seen the Truman Show. Trust me, that sphere of influence is not a natural satellite, and it's otherwise being used to control and oversee the plantation on behalf of some very dark forces. So there are two general forms of bankruptcy, one liquidation and two rehabilitation. Chapter seven of the code is entitled liquidation. The terms straight bankruptcy and bankruptcy often are used to describe liquidation cases under the bankruptcy laws because the vast majority of bankruptcy cases are liquidation cases. In a typical Chapter 7 liquidation case, the trustee collects the non-exempt property of the debtor, converts that property to cash, and distributes the cash to the creditors. The debtor gives up all the non-exempt property she owns at the time of the filing of the bankruptcy petition and hopes to obtain a discharge. Okay, Chapters 11, 12, and 13 of the Bankruptcy Code contemplate debtor rehabilitation in a rehabilitation case, creditors look to future earnings of the debtor, not to the property of the debtor at the time of the initiation of the bankruptcy proceedings to satisfy their claims. The debtor generally retains its assets and makes payments to creditors, usually from post-petition earnings, pursuant to a court-approved plan. Okay, So this is why I said it's a bit of a, a hybrid, even though you know, the system is so backwards, but even within the system, there's still obviously many versions of bankruptcy cases with these corporations that go bust. But when you, like I said, look at it at a macro level, it ticks all the bo boxes based on the definitions as to how this current administration is being run, given the money system and the legal system that's set up with the deceased estates, okay? Quite quite plain to see. A few other important definitions. Underwrite, okay, is to write beneath, to subscribe, of an insurer to execute and deliver, an insurance policy to undertake to pay a pledge of money, a subscription, okay, and to engage to buy all the shares for instance, in a new venture company or other enterprise, especially when not subscribed for by the public, specifically to arrange to sell shares in a company while agreeing to buy any not sold to them, okay, to support any activity plan, etc., with money while taking on full financial responsibility for a failure. We've got underwriter, that's from Black Store. This is from Black Store. The party who takes upon himself the risk is called the insurer, sometimes the underwriter, from his subscribing his name at the foot of the policy treaties on the law of insurance and there's a comment down here uh, where it says the term underwriter derives its meaning from the former British insurance practices when insuring their cargo shippers would seek out investors to insure their property the insurers would add their signatures and would write their names under those of the shippers hence the term underwriters both in terms of the insurance industry and the securities markets the concept of underwriting has expanded significantly since its inception. Okay, no thanks to debasing the money uh, where a lot of financial innovation has happened through the derivative markets too, okay, and these, these depository trust clearing corporations where they're issuing, you know, basically colorable titles and from there they're deriving all kinds of derivative contracts um, from the real thing, but everyone's kind of given a proxy and it's the same as the things we think we own. We're registered keepers or have dealer title on our homes or, you know, registered keeper for the car don't actually own it because it's under it's pledged as collateral under this bankruptcy and insolvency that we're in where the international creditors hold legal title true allodial title okay and that's that's the key and that's why you know everything's it's underwritten because in international law which is a you know the maritime amity deals with international contracts and because we're in a colorable version of that which is called statutory jurisdiction internationally in bankruptcy everything has to be insured bonded and licensed 
Okay, so it's all, it's like a form of martial law, basically. We're in like this this prison. This this is this, it's, it's yeah, it's pretty mad this system anyway. But that's why you know they underwrite everything. That's why they have undertakers. That's why the the judges you know they wear black. They send you a summons. They all rise. These guys are necromancers because they're all governing dead fictional entities. They're mere ink on paper. Okay, so if you come in thinking that you got to present that what they're issuing you in these presentments and these letters is you, then you turn up then you're pinned to the cross and you're taking on the burden of the straw man, which is the burden of the entire system of debt that can never be paid off because they only print the principal amount of the money. <laughs> and that is charged interest. Okay, so if if all of a sudden the creditors said, right, we want all of our debts repaid, they will only be able to pay off the principal and the interest will be left over as a deficit because they're not printing that. You get me? And that's, that's the problem we're in. And that just drives more and more wedges and gaps between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, because it's only the people on the right side of the ledger who know how to play this game and stay as a creditor in this system, in this setup. So we have the twins in the womb. Okay, going back to our birth event, Romans 9.11, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to an election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Romans 9.11 establishes the election made for the twins at birth, which determines whether you will be treated as either a dead fiction trustee or living beneficiary. The twins in the womb mentioned in the Bible could also be interpreted as the live born and the placenta. Story of Jacob and Esau. Okay, Esau was the live born and Jacob the placenta, representing the straw man. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Jacob replied, First send me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Okay, and there's much benefit as well. And like a lot of people know, with um, you know not cutting the umbilical cord so quickly and letting the, the nutrients drain naturally into the baby over the next two or three days or however long it takes, um, which which you know helps boost the, the the child's growth or the let's call it offspring because child's a bit of a tainted word isn't it it's a stillborn but the offspring the living heir your living son or daughter's you know um, growth potential um, is hindered massively if, as soon as they cut that okay but that's obviously another another take on how you can interpret this this kind of stillborn these two people in the womb right because it's considered like almost like a guardian angel in that regard. Our ancients knew how important the placenta was. So another interpretation of this could be that the placenta stole her birthright by dying in test eight for which a trust was set up, and that trust is under administration in the name of the father. Regardless, there is ver verifiable proof that by filling out the certificate of birth that is called the source document, a dead fictional character has been created in the name of the father and of the son, all held in trust, and the son's birthright has been stolen by virtue of the assumptions, presumptions, and language used in the legal forms, definitions, and procedures. As the Bible says in the beginning, the world was without form. Again, a form was created to debase the living man or woman into playing surety and trustee for dead fictional entities and the colourable jurisdiction that governs them. Furthermore, in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is God? It is the Word. The Word is what governs our body politics. It is what can be used as evidence with what I have proven in the forensics of the forms, definitions of words, and registration of birth to mean something completely different than what it purports to be on the surface and at face value. The legal world has a completely different language than plain simple English, evidenced by the many legal and law dictionaries that are copyright and owned by a private corporation. The father's name can also be construed as being synonymous with Lord and God, the false one, as mentioned in the Bible, which represents the crown, which again is the dead corporate one. Okay, much better to have your, your living crown back and claim that back. With the Bible warning us not to use the father's name in vain. So the Lord's Prayer, Matthew, it kind of mentions how holy the father's name is. Our Father which art in heaven, Hallowed means holy, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, in Exodus 27, thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord God, Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. By taking the Father's name, Middle Ditch, I have now bound myself to the Holy Ghost Alexander George Middleditch, which is this birth certificate, ends legal sense, the income paper, Holy Ghost. 
And it says also in Matthew 16, 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. By adding the Father's name, me, Alexander George, the living became surety to the trusted up in the name of the Father. Okay, so this is otherwise taken out of a pack that I sent in to have all of this amended, right? For the record on the record to resurrect the Son of God and of my Father, which is me, and revive the trust. Okay, so that's why you see the reference there, figure one. So referenced as figure one in that pack. So please see figure one for rep representation of this trust set up and the two systems operating alongside one another with the three entities established. You've got the father, which is my surname, which is the SETI KB trust that takes on the roles of executive administrator crown, set to the creator, and is otherwise the, the corporate crown. And we have the son, which is me, you know, the given Christian name, Alexander George, identify again, you can only control what's been given to you, right? Okay, so that's, that's representative of our born identity. Like I said, you can link your given name to the entry number shown in their registered books, okay, which is otherwise indicative and shown on the birth certificate and or the extract of birth, whatever the equivalent is for your nation. So identified by the source document and extracts showing the separation of the son and the father's name, but more so the source document shows that for me, that was all that I was given. Once it ended up in the hands of the state with the registrar. You can see that's when they joined the father's name to my given name to start to set up creating this, this Holy Ghost entity. Okay, so showing the separation of the son and the father's name, who is a live born, living, principal, beneficiary, personal, authorized representative, the Jewish party, the only one that can give life to the trust. Okay, and the Holy Ghost, which is the birth certificate, straw man, identifying the entity legal entity where the given name, Alexander George, has been joined to the name of the father and is a vacant position and needs an agent to represent it which is often assigned the role of trustee by a subrogation in which Alexander George steps in as surety for. Okay, so it's a good little diagram there that kind of captures uh, a snapshot as to what's going on. Subrogation, again, this is important because through the Holy Ghost, when we step up to represent it, not in an authorized capacity, but as surety, thinking that we are it, um, taking on the role of being nailed to the cross, they then subrogate and they make us trustee where they're executive beneficiary within the trust structure and end up, you know, we end up having to pay. So inequity, the substitution of one person for another, says so subrogation in respect of a lawful claim, demand or right, so that the person substituted succeeds to or acquires the rights, remedies or securities of the other in relation to the claim. For example, the right of an insurance company to claim against a party for an injury or damage to the insured in the place of the insured. Insurance, the principal whereby an insurer is entitled to the rights and remedies of an insurance insured against a third party of parties once the insurer has provided indemnity to the insured. Okay, see insurance contracts. Again, it's all about insurance. So we have the um, double entry bookkeeping system is the cross. Okay, because so it's like a ledger and Jesus died on the cross to forgive us all of our sins. Sins equals debt, as I mentioned before. It's the sine wave two, which is time, which is what all these debt instruments have been securities are being tracked with in regards to their maturities, right? Time, old man Kronos, the canon there, the reckoning of debt, debts and taxes. The age of Pisces is all about forgiveness. The age of Aries was about sacrifice. The age of Aquarius is all about enlightenment, truth and love. To accept the crisis, to accept the charge on your account ledger and discharge it using your limited exemption through Christ's forgiveness of debt. That can only happen when you resurrect yourself and revive the trust and resurrect the Christ within. The advanced treasury pack on Sovereignty Masterclass touches on this concept of accepting the Christ and using your unlimited exemption, but you first must be indemnified and have your set off bond and stuff like this. Okay, that's one way of doing it. There's many different ways of coming out of the system like I'm realizing now, so I'm progressing this journey and find, you know, coming to more wisdom. And once you, you know, have the knowledge, the well of knowledge to pull from in order to put pen to paper, you'll see that there's there's many roads to uniting the two kingdoms, right? And unlocking, unbinding that which is in heaven for you that is also on earth, okay? So you can move over to the kingdom of heaven on earth, as you can see. So you've got the debits on the left-hand side, which is the kingdom of hell on earth. Credit on the right-hand side, which is the kingdom of heaven on earth. Kingdom of hell is the public realm. They're, they're administering names, okay? And that's why every boat, they need a name and every boat needs to be registered, okay? If you look at actually all the vessels, on the actual seas, under maritime law, everyone has to have a name and it has to be registered. 
okay? The name's always in all capitalized letters too, pretty much. So that's what they're treating us as, or the straw man. Applies for privileges, um, has a bank account, you know, remains a child, unfortunately stuck in that child archetype. Epigenetically, we've been domesticated for so long down here in this plantation um, through DNA manipulation, all kinds of different tactics, dark magic, entrainment, mind control techniques. They've pretty much mastered it. Um, but lucky for us, there's, there's a lot of powerful souls incarnating here at this time that heard the call to help with this shift. Um, and um, it's, it is underway. But it's up to each and every one of us to you know, raise the Christ within and start uniting the kingdoms and the two hemispheres of our brain too. So we've been stuck in the left left side of the brain for, for too long. And so when you start activating a, a higher self or you know, a thinking outside the box kind of creative self, which allows you to see and read between the lines and really find the answer too, which is, you know, again, uniting those, those two hemispheres as above, so below, and as within, so without. So it's dead. Um, corporations, dead corps, dead corporate entities, um, reserve bank, must buy stuff with reserve bank currency, perpetuates debt, and is always stuck in the ego mindset, is always arguing and acting in dishonor, which is not good because, you know, that's otherwise what the courts thrive off of and the system thrives off of is argument and controversy, okay? Uh, even mentions in the Bible, agree with thy adversary quickly or else you'll be put in front of a judge and the judge will do all manner of things to you, chuck you in jail, prison, etc. Okay, so it's always good to agree with our adversary, act in honor, noble, peaceful, peaceful and honorable, which otherwise on the creditor side of the ledger, the kingdom of heaven and earth is private. Okay, we have a born identity, we're sovereign, we've claimed back our living crown, living heirs to the kingdom of God, son of our father and son of God too, or daughter. Must notify everyone, um, Christian, or Muslim or Jewish name, right? You're alive, you bang with the treasury, makes payment by set off, balances the books, it's spirit, spiritual, peaceful, and honorable. Okay, and interestingly, in John 14, 6, Jesus says, you cannot get to the Father, said so he gave me trust accounts, one interpretation anyway, right? Except through me, the Son, the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, so the way is to seek the truth, and the life is to come back to life and stop playing the role of the Holy Ghost. So more evidence of this Holy Trinity is seen in the IDs. You've got the, the Father's name and the Son, in my instance, separated the given name, right? And you've got a color photo depicting the living and a kind of hologram, opaque photo depicting the dead, Holy Ghost. Same on my Australian passport, as you can see. Also on the licenses, Okay, which is just a license to conduct commerce upon their sea lanes. Postcodes are port codes, houses are foreign vessels in dry dock, as are courts. And then again, a driving license to the UK. So it's all there. It's right under our noses, in our faces. Separate the father name, father's name, given name, living photo, and the opaque Holy Ghost. Okay, any name they address you in apart from just your given name is addressing the Holy Ghost creature of law. Any title like Mr. Mrs. or Miss has deplumed you of your feathers. Okay, and deplume comes from diploma, which is what the issue when you go to university where you get, they give you one degree, right, when there's 360 and it's a Masonic ritual venerating Saturn again, Satan, which is what these guys venerate. Saturn governs money, banking, finance and law. They wear all black, the color of satin is black, lead is the element, it's very heavy but malleable, right? And they give you a mortarboard cap to put on, which is indicative of them mixing their cement, using you to mix their cement to build their foundations for them to walk on top of you and use you as their little worker slaves. So I knew all of this. When first year within university, I was working all this out. So I never turned up to my graduation ceremony. I never bought the gown and partaken into that sick ritual right but i had to go through these institutions just to see the amount of i guess insanity going on with the curriculum and that they don't teach you a thing it's all a process again of getting you in debt to service that debt as soon as you leave in another dead corpse entity called a corporation um where you then pledge you know then where you then on the ladder of serving that debt and at some point in the future, you'll take out a car loan and serve that loan as well, serve that debt, and then another mort gauge, which is a death pledge, to serve that debt. <laughs> and it's just all a, 
a process of, of control because debt incumbent households do not go on strike. It's as simple as that. So there, to plume your feathers, right, Mr. And Mrs. is the lowest rank on board a ship, demoted during a rank from that of a master. Okay, from that of live to dead, to the real world, to the world of fiction, personas, and ink on paper that need actors to play out Satan's script and be subservient to the government, which is an extension of the Shaitani. Watch Pierce the Back, read Pierce the Back's book, watch his research on YouTube, amazing. The rulers of your mind, meant is mental. Everyone's mental under this system. Right, so we have Born Identity. Anyone seen this movie? It's tied into the Seti Act 1666, which is another act that assumes and presumes us as being dead after a certain period of time, okay? The opening scene of this movie is Jason Bourne here, played by Matt Damon, face down in the sea. And then a vessel comes along, pulls him up, resuscitates him, and the whole movie is all about him trying to find out who he is, okay? So it's probably, again, telling us about, you know, our journey when we're incarnating into this matrix and memories blank slated, and we're kind of in an escape room and we've got to work out, remember who we are, like Simba in Lion King, and it's come back to claim our, our crown. Seti Act 1666, everyone's heard about this, you know, an act for redress of in inconveniences by one of the diseases of persons beyond seas or absenting themselves upon whose lives estates do depend. In section one, Seti KV remaining beyond sea for seven years together and no proof of their lives. Judge an action to, verdict, to direct a verdict as though Seti KV were dead. Section four, if the supposed dead man proved to be alive, then the title was revested, action to mean profits with interest. Okay, so another one, after seven years, they declare us dead and lost at sea unless there's proof to the contrary. Okay, in which case the title will be revested. Definition, so have a look at what CDK trust means. It means a person for whose benefit a trust is created. That is a beneficiary. A CDK trust has the equitable, not legal estate. Okay, so also beneficial interest beneficiary to decay use, and we have the Sedicay V, which is the one who lives, a person who, whose life provides the measure of duration of an estate per ultra V. See also estate per ultra V, life estate. Okay, so as soon as we're born, the old saying, you're worth your weight in gold, it's very true. Once that entity is set up, you're declared dead, and they're administering the estate. An insurance policy is taken out in your life under the name of the straw man, the father and the son, or father and the daughter, and that is held in unclaimed money funds, which is all part of the Seti KV Trust, okay, but they've got multiple accounts within that trust, which is given these names, such as the Treasury Unclaimed Money Fund, Treasury Direct Account, um, you know, Consolidated Fund, the Commonwealth, all right, and, the, and through their acts, if you research on the Public Trustee Act or Public Trust Act or Financial Administration and Audit Act, etc., or just type in the legislation keywords such as unclaimed monies, you'll see how this is all governed and all managed, and it's all the the interest and annuities that come out from the, the insurance policy because this is what these insurance firms do. They invest in the securities market um, and make a lot of money on your behalf. And otherwise, if you're considered dead, then you're not a beneficiary. You can't receive the, the proceeds from it as and when they're paid out and also when it matures, okay, such as endowment policies. So this, this is the nature of one who lives. And this is why they've done what they've done to trick us into being dead through the nature of these forms. Um, because you can't pay out any of the res in these trusts from their investments if a beneficiary is dead. And so then they can come in and claim it for themselves. And that's that's basically why they're doing what they're doing. So they can live off your sweat equity and your wealth and the investments they're making in your name. So we're going to have a little bit of history here. Set a KB Trust. Um, got this online. A lot of this is inspired from Bill Turner's work and presentations. Um, so yeah, I want to give credit to him. Because uh, he's he's a very very good teacher out there who's managing to t connect a lot of the dots, especially with the scripture and the movies and the songs, which not many people out there can do. So I don't think many people on this journey have activated the higher mind truly, in order to see the bigger picture and connect all these seemingly unrelated concepts together and have a holistic view of this, a syncretic view. Um, so kudos to him, because um, yeah, a lot of this is inspired from his work. So Seti KB Trust. Uh, the first crown of crown lands, Pope Boniface VIII, was the first leader in history to create the concept of a trust, but the first testamentary trust through a deed and will creating a deceased estate was created by Pope Nicholas V in 1455, okay, through the paper ball Romanus Pontifex. This is only one of three paper balls to include the line with the incipit for a perpetual remembrance. Okay, this ball had the effect of conveying the right of the use of the land as real property from the express trust Unum Sanctum to the control of the pontiff 
and his successors in perpetuity. Hence, all land is claimed as crown land, and this first crown is represented by the first set of KB trust created when a child is born. It deprives us all, it deprives us of all beneficial entitlements and rights on the land. Then we have the second crown of the Commonwealth. The second crown was created in 1481 with the paper ball attorney regis, meaning eternal crown, with six this the fourth being only the second of three paper ball as deeds of testamentary trusts. This paper ball created the crown of Aragon, later known as the crown of Spain, and is the highest sovereign and highest steward of all Roman slaves subject to the rule of the Roman pontiff. Spain lost the crown in 1604 when it was granted to King James I of England by Pope Paul V after the successful passage of the Union of Crowns or Commonwealth in 1605 after the false flag operation of the gunpowder plot. So the crown was finally lost by England in 1975 when it was returned to Spain and King Carlos I, where it remains to this day. This second crown is represented by the second set of KB Trust, created when a child was born, and by the sale of the birth certificate as a bond to the private central bank of the nation, depriving us of ownership of our flesh and condemning us to perpetual servitude as a Roman person or slave. The third crown of the ecclesiastical see is was made in 1537 by Paul III through the Papal Ball Convocation, also meant to open the Council of Trent. It is the third and the final testamentary deed and will of a testamentary trust set up for the claiming of all lost souls lost to the sea. The Venetians assisted in the creation of the Sede Act of 1540 to use this Papal Ball as the basis of ecclesiastical authority of Henry VIII. This crown was secretly granted to England in the collection and reaping of lost souls. So the Pope's main goal was to try to control all the lands of the world under the doctrine that he is the Vicar of Christ, using the myth of Jesus Christ to achieve this, placing him at the top of the chain, and by using the myth to his and who he serves benefits, he would proclaim that he was the owner of all lands on behalf of Jesus until such time as Jesus would return and he would supposedly hand it back to him. I mean, that is very interesting. I mean, the jury the jury's out for me in regards to this entity, Jesus Christ, because um, I've had conflicting experiences, one of which I was shown he is Lucifer, playing the smiter and the saviour, but other times I've been in situations in the astrals where I've said in the name of Jesus Christ and been able to expel demons. Okay, but then you have other versions of people saying that there was three Christs during this period, one of which was just an ad advocate and follower of the real Jeshua 12, who is teaching about the Stargates and all the things that are coming back in regards to our holographic time matrix, the history, the races, the agendas, the technologies, right? Um, otherwise, under Iashiana's teachings, um, that's going to be coming in the age of Aquarius, that this guy Hammurabi was following and kind of being a loudmouth about trying to preach to the, the rest of the people that they used him as a sacrificial lamb to set up this martyrdom, you know, die for your gods, um, to control what otherwise the real Jesus Christ had an impact on um, in preparation for this time with the stellar activation cycle that started in 2000 to 2017, right? And that we're still kind of going through at the moment. And then he had a, I think it was like a, said Jeshua 9, who had like nine, the numbers refer to the, the amount of subharmonics in the DNA strands that are activated that tied into the stargates of a universal stargate system. That Jeshua 9 was actually ordained by Jeshua 12, who incarnated it first around that time. Um, but they were working together, but otherwise Jeshua 9, he was covertly working for the dark forces, like the Anunnaki, right? Um, and got in between Jeshua 12 and his twin flame, so-called Mary. Um, so this time around, Jeshua 12 was having to, you know, deal with that. But so this, this is what I mean. It's, it's very convoluted because I've, I've been shown like very vivid experiences that Jesus is Lucifer. But there's obviously going to be this kind of maybe bad aspect of the dark forces mimicking the true Jeshua 12, potentially, who knows, um, in order to, you know, fulfill this role of someone claiming to be Jesus to come back and say, like, okay, yeah, here, you've got the whole world in your hands now, which to me seems like more of a Luciferian doctrine to set up the stage for that to happen in order for, you know, Lucifer or Satan to come in and rule um, rather than, you know, the real Jesus. But we have to wait and see. I mean, it makes sense. You know, like a knife can be used to either, you know, cook a beautiful meal or stab someone in the back. These governments and corporations and entities are, are the same. They're just instruments, okay? So they can be used to do good or bad. It just depends on the user, okay? So it just, it'd be very, very interesting to see 
the, the real truth surrounding all of this, okay? Um, anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll carry on because I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because I'll be here for fucking hours. <laughs> so contained within this is every living, breathing creature, including us, basically in servitude to his wishes and all he commands. This was done through a legal system called canon law, the law of contracting that works through fictions, as it itself is only a fiction. So to set the stage, we have the Pope at the top of the chain, supposedly owning all land and everything upon it, and canon law is the script for the play. The principles of the script to be that the principles of religion contribute most powerfully to keep nations in the state of passive obedience, including their kings and queens. In being the vicar of Christ, the number one law to be used at first was the fear of God, and this is exactly what was used against King John to make him succumb to the Pope's wishes. So we got this concept of, you know, possession is nine-tenths of the law. I said, what is the other tenth title? Okay, and 1 Samuel 8, 10 to 22, Israel asks for a king, kind of warns about this system that we are a part of now that is set up, that's otherwise again codified in the Bible. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plough his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants, your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth, which is title of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king. You have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Okay, so again, it's pretty much shown you again through having a bad king, someone that these people want to entrust, like the governments now, okay, which the crown acts in right of and through and these entities, these beings, this, these spirits, in order to subjugate you and they write the script in order for you to be part of and subject to all of this, serving your Lord, your master, right? It also says in the Bible that God has no respect to a persons. Okay, and again, remember the definition of persona, this, this fictional entity. In Acts 10.34, God has no respect to a persons, okay? And interestingly, in the statue of Westminster of 1275, statue of Westminster the first, which is still codified and enacted in the United Kingdom and the state of Victoria and New Zealand, interestingly enough, it says in one of the verses there um, that now anticipates that of our own day, on the one hand, common rights to be done to all, as well as rich and poor, without respect to persons. Okay, because you know, even the Bible, the God is no respect to all persons. These fictional decadent estates, these dead ink on paper entities used to drag you into the underworld. So we're going to touch on a little bit more history prior to all of this papal bullshit that was going on around them with the Vatican and these popes is the law of Mortmain. Okay, so that's another very significant event that happened um, that stripped us of our title. So before the year 1066, the people of England held a loyal title to the land. Not even a king could take away the land for not paying tithing. William the Conqueror came in 1066 and stole the king's title and took the land off the people. From William I, 1066, to King John, 1199, England was in dire straits financially. In an effort to raise money, King John invoked the law of Mortmain, which is the dead man's hand, so people were unable to pass their land onto the church or anyone else without the king's permission, which is modern day probate. Without Mortmain, the king would lose the income from the land he controlled. The Vatican did not like that because the king was in debt to the Vatican. A quarrel erupted between the Pope and the King John, and King John, when he refused to accept the Vatican's representative, Stephen Langton, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, whom Pope Innocent III installed to rule England. In 1207, England was placed under papal interdict, and two years later, King John was excommunicado. Anyone seen, what's that movie? John Wick, excommunicado. That's again, that's another good movie showing you the private side of the ledger of these guys, okay, when they're doing the hitman jobs, the assassinations, they're only dealing the gold and silver. And they have their own private cleanup crews and they get the public police agents involved because they're only there to administer dead fictional straw men and women. 
were belligerent, still stuck in the child archetype. A quarrel erupted. Sorry, I read that. Stephen Langton was a central figure in the dispute between King William of England and Pope Innocent III, which was a contributing factor to the crisis which led to the issuing of the Magna Carta in 1215. He is also credited with having divided the Bible into the standard model arrangement of chapters used today. King John, in trying to regain his stature, had to grovel before the Pope and return the title to his kingdoms of England and Ireland to the Pope as vassals and swore submission and loyalty to him. King John accepted Langton as Archbishop of Canterbury and offered the Pope a vassal's bond of fealty, of fealty and homage. Two months later, in July of 1213, King John was absolved and excommunicado by Langton at Winchester. On October 3rd, 1213, by treaty, King John ratified his surrender of his kingdoms to the Pope as Vicar of Christ. Two years prior, the Treaty of Verona was signed. King John, as most kings tried to no avail to establish, as William the Conqueror did, a dictatorship. This seems to be the model to follow, and William set a precedent that all kings and queens should would try to follow, or at least they would try to push the boundaries further set out in the doctrines written by the Church of Rome. The contract, which was the Treaty of Verona in 1213, was between two parties. The barons of England were not put up with being slaves anymore, so they took to the sword and made King John sign the Magna Carta. It's kind of under duress. This act of the barons violated the principle of natural law, which is common law of contracting, which means that you can't sign anything. Valid, you can't have a valid contract if someone signs under duress, duress, which rendered the Magna Carta as having no force or effect upon a contract between two parties. Pope Boniface VII, which is obviously another, another reason as well, you need both signatories to the original contract if you want to amend or cancel that original contract. Pope Boniface VII, the other party, thought so, for he declared the Magna Carta to be unlawful, and unjust, as it is base and shameful, whereby the apostolic see is brought into contempt and the royal prerogative diminished, the English outraged, and the whole enterprise of the crusade greatly imperiled. Okay, and so how could the Pope declare the Magna Carta unlawful and unjust? The Treaty of Verona 1213 between King John and the Pope was a contract between two parties, therefore the agreement can only be modified or altered by the two signatories. So anyone still relying on Magna Carta and common law and stuff, Given the system that we're in now with this colourable law system with the colourable currency of security, securities law, which is you know otherwise managed clandestinely through uh, statutory jurisdiction, which is a colour of amity jurisdiction, um, isn't going to find the remedy because the the remedy from from common law and the merchant's law is still codified in the UCC. And if anyone wants proof of that, go and watch the UCC connection presentation I did from that book. I forgot the name of the author, I think it's a pen name, um, that explained it beautifully um, and showed how, you know, contract laws is the top law to rely on because everything is contract, everything is done through our consent and consent makes the contract. Okay, so we're under contract law and so through this colourable system that we're now in with the colourable money that we're using and the contracts that are forming as a result of that and the language being used, you must look at the definitions under the UCC in regards to now the definitions surrounding agreement and what is needed for a valid contract under this system, which is completely different to the common law requirements for a contract. Okay, it's a lot easier to get agreement under this system with all these fiction entities and colorable currencies and colorable system that we're in. Okay, so highly recommend watching that. Um, the UCC connection, I did a presentation, it's on my YouTube channel. Or you can go and buy the book on Amazon. So in 1302, recap, Pope Boniface issued his infamous papable unum sanctum, being the first express trust and claimed control over the whole planet and effectively king of the world. Okay, Pope Boniface VIII was the first leader in history to create the concept of a trust. The first testamentary trust through a deed and will created in a deceased estate was not until Pope Nicholas V in 1455 through the papal bull Romanus Ponticus. This is only one of three paper bulls to include the line with the incipit for a perpetual remembrance. This bull had the effect of conveying the right of use of the land as real property from the express trust unum sanctum to the control of the pontiff and his successes in perpetuity. Hence, all land is claimed as crown land. So in 1666, an act was passed to set us free, should we ever understand it? Said it can be act, okay? And proof is the establishment by evidence of a requisite degree of belief concerning the fact in the mind of the trier of fact or the court. Now this, this is where I believe there's another trick now, I don't think anyone else I've heard has picked up on this, okay, which is surrounding an affidavit. Okay, so an affidavit is obviously under their legal maxims, is the truth in law, a rebatted affidavit is, you know, judgment in commerce, etc. 
However, an affidavit implies that you've sworn an oath. And also an affidavit, if you look at the etymology of the word, also goes back to fox excrement, okay, um, under forestry or something weird like that. Okay, so a much, much purer word, I believe, to use is affirmation, okay. So in Matthew 5, 34 to 35, it says, But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Okay, so again, the Holy Bible is their code book, and you don't want to blaspheme their code book, um, so otherwise you'll be in contempt. Um, and that's why, obviously, I've learned that that's how they get a lot of people in contempt of court to swear an oath, whereas you should always reference that if you ever, you know, on the stand, which you shouldn't be, it's the court, it's the paper, it's the four corners, right? It's, it's where you reserve all your right angles within the four corners. This is your court, okay? So when you know how to govern your court properly, you have the highest claim, the highest court as the living crown, living heir, principal, beneficiary, secure party and creditor, sovereign, postmaster general, right? And you never end up in court, but if you do, you can always, and even on your paper as well, when putting forth an affidavit, do it in the form of an affirmation. It's a much cleaner word or solemn declaration. Okay, and quote that in the Bible. Say, hey, look, the Bible says not to swear a no, so I'm coming in with an affirmation and a solemn declaration. Thank you very much. So I don't want to be blaspheming your book and um, otherwise being in contempt. So affirmation, it says, this is out of Lexis Nexus, confirmation, ratification to a solemn declaration that is asserted to be true, evidence, a solemn declaration by a witness or interpreter that the evidence or interpretation he or she gives will be truthful. For example, Evidence Act 1995 is a witness must usually take an oath or make an affirmation before giving evidence. For example, Evidence Act 1995, see also false swearing, jurat, oath, perjury, sworn evidence, um, unsworn. And so this again, in relation to what went on with William the Conqueror after 1066 when he you know, defeated Herald and changed the whole system prior to which you know people in England had a loyal title and this is the reason why he did what he did with the doomsday book because the rec it was the record of a great survey of the lands and the population of England taken by William the Conqueror in 1086. The book records the value ownership and liabilities of the land and contains a great deal of information on the economic organization of England at the time. The survey was undertaken to resolve disputes as to ownership of land and taxation liabilities to the crown following the disruption caused by widespread Norman settlement. Okay, so remember 1 Samuel, Israel warning, Israel warns about a king. Okay, now it's going to take a tenth year. You see your sons, okay, going to basically, you know, put you in servitude to the king. That's otherwise exactly what happened under his reign after 1066. Okay, and that's why he did it. He had to go and survey all the lands, get a description of all the property because he was then going to claim title to it and then give possession in return which is under usury which is the right to possess okay and then if you have the right to possess then you must follow all the laws of the title holder which is you know nowadays in the acts codes rules regulations and legislation okay and rent to pay your rental fees is disguised as taxes in order for you to use the thing because uh, you're again merely just a registered keeper or a borrower, okay, which is evidence of like a deed of title. No one has a lodial title or a lodial proprietorship anymore. Because you can't as well, because when you're buying and selling, anything you think you own, you're using debt notes, okay, which means again, that you can't actually purchase true lodial title when using their fiat debt currency notes, because you're only using colorable currency. If you're using colorable currency, then you're gonna get a colorable title in return. A fiction for a fiction. So they have the 10 maxims of law. Um, you guys can pause and read through this. This is pretty trivial stuff, um, going back to basics, but again, you can see how it's all referenced in the Bible, okay? All of their laws and most of their acts that they've relied on um, and you know printed out and typed out goes back to the Holy Bible. And then you go obviously with what they're doing. Through the straw man is taking us from the land of the living to the law of the sea um, and subjecting us to be dead corporate fictions under the statutes and acts, which is all basically a colorable version of Amity Maritime Law. So just remember guys, you know, they're only pieces of paper at the end of the day, a paper under black store is a written or printed document or instrument and a negotiable document or instrument evidencing a debt, okay, especially commercial documents or negotiable instruments considered as group. All right, you've got to drop the fear, which is just false evidence appearing real, which is pretty much exactly what it is. And once you 
in order to dispel the fear, you must have knowledge because knowledge is power. And that's what's going to help dispel your fear and your overreactions to these things. And, you know, your emotional body getting out of control whenever you see your name on a bit of paper from the tax agency or the courts or whatever else. And you'll be able to govern yourself accordingly, um, get your shit together and stop being a wince and, you know, rise up, be an adult, get out of the child archetype and take back control, take responsibility and be accountable and um, be, be the one that changes this, this kind of generational curse that many of our ancestors and you know, parents have been stuck in for a very, very long time. Okay, break the curse. The pen is mightier than the sword, as we know. I've got that tattooed on me. Okay, so always act in honor and grace and peaceable and intelligently on paper, so no need to protest. And you never want to argue. Okay, never agree without a condition, conditional acceptance, and never fall silent. Okay, because silence is acquiescence. We can use that to our advantage too when getting them when drawing consent from them, okay, when issuing our terms and conditions again, and otherwise expressing our will and declaration. So always act as king by asking questions, okay, um, the king's and queen's court is your documents bearing your seal, your seal is your thumbprints, right, it's the most powerful print or seal that you can possess, otherwise how is the full backing of all of your weight behind the document. Search for unclaimed monies in your legislation, like I said before, yeah, take responsibility, be accountable, level up, study harder, remember you only get out what you put in, and be patient and let your spirit grow into this, okay? And um, best of luck, stay blessed, stay happy, stay safe, and um, stay sovereign as always. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. All the best. Speak soon. Ciao for now.